What have you found uh, that's maybe different in Mongolian Buddhism and how maybe perhaps the, the religion has become part of the culture and how vice versa, how, how Mongolians use it? What have you found that was intriguing? Yeah, well, that's a good uh, question. And in a way, I think we, as scholars we are still trying to get a clear uh, understanding of it. When I was a graduate student in the 1980s and I said, uh, to some professors and to my uh, colleagues, you know, graduate students, that I wanted to study Mongolian. First, they say, "Why?" I said, "Well, nobody's studying Mongolian Buddhism. I want to see what it is about. There is a whole canon that no, you know, Ganju and Ganju that uh, no one is studying." And they said, "But why? Mongols never wrote anything. It's same as Tibetan Buddhism." I saw, well, I looked, you know, in Japanese Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, they're so different in many ways than Indian, you know, Buddhism, and uh, but still called Buddhism. So I thought, how is that possible? There must be something there that's, you know, still uniquely uh, Mongolian. And I still search for it, and I have found definitely certain elements. Uh, first, first fact I found is that Mongols have written a great deal. But those years, because many Mongolian scholars and lamas wrote in Tibetan, mm -hmm. and they had monastic names in Tibetan, so they didn't even know that these are Mongols. And they saw that these are just Tibetans, so they said the Mongols never produced anything. <laughs> well, I found out they produced a great deal and contributed um, vastly to Tibetan Buddhism itself, that n not only that they were receiving from uh, Tibet, when they went to, to Kumbum and Drepung and the uh, you know, Sera Monastery, um, that, that they studied there, that also coming back to Mongolia and continuing their studies, that oftentimes the, some of the greatest scholars went back to Tibet and became very influential teachers there, and also great writers who even Tibetans to these days are studying. Sometimes they're not credited enough, I think, for what they contributed to Tibetan Buddhism. But in terms of philosophy, they, they, they were the best debaters. You know, sometimes uh, Tibetans were really uh, exasperated by this, because Mongols always won as in debates. The Tibetans, in, when they engaged with Mongols in debates, always lost it, you know. And it was like now they sumo wrestlers, you know. So <laughs> they, they were Japanese don't feel anymore watching sumo because they already know Mongol will win it. So same, same thing was happening with, with the logical debates. They were great logicians. And then Tibetans would say, even today, so I heard some Tibetans say, oh, you know, the Mongols, they just sit in those steps, they look in the space, <laughs> they're trying to see this, and then somehow they win, you know. Uh, so when it comes to philosophical ideas, uh, whether it is Matyamaka philosophy, or, so of course, you, there is nothing particularly unique. You may find some new interesting uh, interpretations that Mongolian scholars have given that you don't find necessarily in uh, Tibetan writings. Often time analogies and metaphors that they bring even their writings are closer to Mongolian lifestyle, you know. Uh, as um, a humble lama of uh, Dzungure said to me long ago, so 15 years ago, he said, you know, when I open 
a book that um, a Mongol wrote in Tibetan. I look and says, oh, only Mongol would say it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, there are these kind of elements, right? <coughs> but what, you, what I found most distinctive features uh, was in popular uh, practices, something that are brought into uh, pastoral life, or the elements that are brought from knowledge and wisdom of pastoral life into kind of these practices, how this fusion, uh, you know, has happened, where one have influenced the others, kind of mutual influence, but also uh, in, in terms of uh, how Mongolians have domesticated certain deities, whether it's Ochivan or Yamantaka or so on, or, you know, that uh, they, some of these Buddhist deities have become a part of Mongolian landscape. You know, they have been kind of made into Mongols. Ochivan <coughs> in, you know, in uh, Zalhan, <laughs> well, you know, in Odgontenger, he has become a Mongol. That's his place. You know, this is his uh, uh, mountain has become viewed as his uh, natural body. So uh, landscapes have become kind of Buddhanized and the deities have brought in and they play a different function than they have did in India or in Tibet. They are kind of, they serve Mongolia in a particular way. So not only that I felt Mongolia has been influenced Buddhism, but that Mongolia has also transformed these Buddhist deities in a particular, particular way. So it's kind of interesting, this uh, mutual you know, influence. Okay. <laughs> yes. I was going to ask, um, so when I went to Mongolia two years ago, mm -hmm. um, there's obviously quite a lot of Buddhism there, and it's being revived on a huge yes. scale. But there's also other kinds of religions. Yes. And even in terms of Buddhism, there's other kinds of Buddhism kind of just popping out of nowhere. Yes. And yes. along with that, there's basically any kind of religion that you can find anywhere else in the world, that yes. anyone you can't find. Here, you find in Mongolia now. Mm -hmm. and I just wanted to know, you know, what's happening to Buddhism in this kind of new religious landscape that mm -hmm. Mongolia didn't have previously? Yeah, it's a yeah, very good question. I have followed this question now for 15 years and I have seen a big transformation taking place. Uh, there was a time when Buddhism looked in danger in Mongolia when the, the large influx of Christian missionaries, not only from Europe and America, but specifically from Korea, who are quite aggressive, you know. And uh, even though there were many Buddhist organizations registered by the Minister of Eternal Affairs, uh, it was like 180, like maybe 12 years ago, so 180 uh, organizations, but less Christian, because many of these Christian organizations or other kind of new age groups and so on, there were even Hare Krishna followers for a while in Nawahi. <laughs> um, they were not always legally there, uh, but, they, but they, were, they were sharing, they were kind of, had this anti-Buddhist propaganda, which was kind of similar to early revolutionary period, and this is, Buddh we give Buddhism takes. Like because they were going around with bags of flowers and socks and, you know, giving. And for a while it worked because they had centers in which they provided free language courses. Uh, Mormons were most influential. Even the ambassador of Mongolia was a Mormon for some years. He made it very easy uh, for uh, uh, those who converted to Mormon religion to provide visas to America. It was, uh, if you are following, if you are if you're baptized in Mormon religion and you stay with us for a year, you could get a visa for six months in the United States, either for study or we will find you work. So it of course attracted lots of young people at the time when it was very difficult to get US visas. And then they said, well, if you stay longer for us, then there are other benefits. Uh, and while economy it was really, you know, uh, really, really bad, uh, it was kind of attracting people. But at the same time, many people didn't leave their Buddhist space either. They would, on Sunday they would go to church, and after church they go to Galdera and different places. And even, uh, uh, even some uh, Mongolian past, Christian pastors 
You know, one told me hierarchically that he would go to, after giving sermon in the church, he would go to Gandhian and request prayers for himself. <laughs> uh, but it started to change as the economy got better. Actually now, the people who were following uh, a different religion started coming back to Buddhism. And so you can definitely, I remember in, when I came in 2000 first time and I would walk in London or any monastery, only all grandmas with a little grandson. You could see hardly any younger people. But now you go to London, they have meditation courses, dharma courses, they have uh, retreats for youth, they have different centers, lots of young people, and educated young people, you know. Uh, so kind of, it, it's the, those missionaries have lost a great number of of people, and I don't know that it's not just socioeconomic. There must be some other element uh, there as well. Sorry, increase in shamanism. It, yeah. yeah, some increase in shamanism, but again, uh, yeah, it's been uh, unfortunately it's been lots of competition and sometimes unnecessary. I learned there was this several years, some years ago when uh, uh, monks from Ganden was some other monks sent to Sutta Mountain to worship uh, and was sent on behalf of a government government to make offerings and there was a large group of shamans with their two hundred followers who came to the mountain and said to Buddhists, get off these mountains, it's our mountain. We have been worshiping it, you know since beginning last time, that you have no right to be here. And the Lama said, you know, you have to deal it, go down and deal with your local government or, you know, but we are sent here, we are just doing our job. And police had to come and tell them, please leave these Lamas alone, you know, to perform the rituals. And then when they came down, they slaughtered hundreds of sheep and, uh, and they take, took their intestines out and they lay them out where the passage from a mountain so that, you know, flies came uh, and everything and to kind of ruin the earth, you know. So, and then after that, I think uh, they have tried, government has, I think, tried to make it so that both feel comfortable that this is their place and that kind of cooperate together and worship a mountain together. So, in some places it's working and in some places there is still a little bit competition. But if any big competition will be, it will be from indigenous, I think, religion, not from this foreign uh, religions that kind of come and go and after a while they just don't work because uh, sometimes they don't understand Mongolian mentality, they don't fit quite well, they're trying to impose something that's so foreign, you know, to Mongolian traditional way of life, of thinking, and that it's not working on this. Yes. So you studied um, Mongolian Buddhist history and so on. Which part of that Mongolian Buddhist history is most interesting? Because my grand, uh, grandfather was a Buddhist monk, but uh -huh. medical. Uh, he uh -huh. studied medicine, mm -hmm. and his brother, basically my great uncle, was also a Buddhist monk. But I always think, what part of the tradition is still continuing now? Because when I see some Buddhist monks now in the Gandhan temple, I always think, are you really kind of true lover, the true monk who's actually following the tradition, ethics and everything? So if you see the Mongolian Buddhism now, if you see with the critical eyes, what would you say to the yeah. First, when I came, I was a little bit shocked, you know, how uh, the monks would drink beer and have wives and girlfriends, and I was as if it was kind of like, what? Because before I was only around uh, Tibetan monks, you know, and especially from Gelugpa. In Gelugpa, they were very strict about monastic Vinaya and monastic rules, and I knew Mongolians are Gelugpa, so primarily. So I kind of was first shocked. But then I started, first I understood, then I also started to understand that it has to do with the fact that uh, uh, in Mongolia, then, right now, also still we don't have monasteries where monks can live as monks. You, know, you have places for young children from countryside who come to study, but you don't have it. That kind of, 
And then I thought, oh, maybe this is because of these still social conditions. Country is just recovering, you know, from uh, different uh, periods. You know, still there was a suspicion of religion. People are still saying, oh, these lamas used to be rich, you know, and feudalists and kind of. There was all these elements there. So, and probably some of that is there. But then, as I started looking at history, you know, even like in the early 20th century, 19th century, then I realized there were all, you know, there were monks, like Ihure, who, had, who lived under very strict rules. So I don't know, what, is it because of Manchus and Qing rulers who imposed very strict rules? Because this is the way how they controlled Mongolian male population, you know. Uh, Nobody could leave Ihure without special permit. Everybody had to come, uh, every month had to come back before sunset. You know, very, very strict rules. You know, I looked in several of these legal codes, you know, that were imposed on monastic life by Qing emperors that were, you can see, it's not just about trying to make them good Buddhists and monks, that this was also a political, you know, kind of way of subjugating. Uh, Population, but um, but there are lots of lay kind of lay lamas even in the past, especially in the countryside, and lamas who are ritualists, who are cl closer to ordinary men, you know, who were uh, performing rituals local for local people, uh, so that it wasn't that unusual. Even Alan, I haven't been in Sikkim yet, but Alan told me when. He visited several years that most lamas are actually married in Sikkim, too, simply because Sikkim is a small state within India. There are so many men who, if everybody was just a monk, that small population, Sikkim couldn't support them. So then they, they would also put ropes as a uniform, go perform ritual, and then kind of come home. And that was definitely before the revolutionary oh, way of living mm -hmm. in you. What would you think about that? Yes, it, it has to be way of living. But some people claim it's not religion per se, but a way of living. Whereas I'm not sure about the distinction between mm -hmm. religion and what the way of living is. Well, if religion, religious views remain only kind of views or a theory, right? and not implemented in life, and not becoming transformed into way of life, then they're just like dead letter on a, on a sutra, you know, with no efficacy. It becomes efficacious, it, it becomes living religion when it becomes a way of life. So, uh, but you can't have a way of life, let's say Buddhist way of life, without having under some understanding of the Buddhist principles at least Buddhist ethics, if, if not, you know, philosophy. If you go to Tibet, sometimes you'll see all grandmas, you know, mm -hmm. rolling this uh, on Mani Padme Hum. They don't know about Matyamaka philosophy <laughs> or emptiness, but what they do know, not harming session beings and developing compassion, you know, for everyone and, and doing. So they are kind of embodying, uh, they are living, uh, in a way, these principles to, to, to the best that they know, and... Uh, I was just trying to define myself, mm -hmm. whether I'm a religious person, or whether... Because I don't really know the scripts, I don't know really the philosophy mm -hmm. of Buddhism, what kind of Buddhism uh, in Mongolia mm -hmm. follows. Mm -hmm. For example, with the, in what I feel like, there's my criticism, I think, is, uh, there's not this constructed way of teaching of Buddhism in Mongolia. And therefore you've got so many competitions, either it be mm -hmm. for economic benefits or maybe just because they have, um, most of the big religions they have some sort of book or yeah. some sort of steps to follow. Yeah. Whereas we don't have it. I don't speak Sanskrit. I, yeah. or I could read by right? obviously. It's very, very different. different. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm lost. I really want to believe in this thing, what, what my dad did, mm -hmm. but I can't do it because I need to spend time or sit in a monastery or something like that. Yeah. So it's just, am I a religious person? In your country or is it <laughs> it's what not I for am? me to judge. Or, uh, <laughs> but you do have some faith, right? 
Yeah. You do have faith. So you are a religious person, even if you don't know philosophy. And you are right. At the early time, you know, um, as Buddhism started to come back, the competition from foreign religions was that they were translating Bible, they were translating even the uh, Bhagavad Gita, which you know, was translated in, uh, into Mongolian. At that time, there was not enough. And some young people who were converting to these religions, when I asked them, why are you, you know, following this? They said, oh, because it's in Mongolian and I can understand it, you know, kind of, it makes sense to me. But since, since then things have changed. Now there are um, small centers, larger centers, even, as I said, Gandhi is now offering courses, meditation classes every evening throughout till summer, you know, e even in the morning. Some people are now six o'clock in the morning, you know, like no water tells me, ah. Sometimes I don't want to get up in the winter, but they're so enthusiastic. They all want to meditate before work, which, which always is followed with some instruction. Now, you know, uh, there is quite many teachings. And the more teachings there are, more people are be uh, becoming enthusiastic. And they also are starting thinking in practical ways. How can I bring it into my life? I went... Uh, uh, once, uh, it was in Islam as of us, you know, Man, uh, uh, Foundation, FPMT, yeah, no, Mahayana Foundation, I remember some years ago, and some monk from Australia was giving teachings on Shanti Deva's Guide to Bodhisattva Way of Life. There were 100 people regularly at these teachings, and it surprised me because that's something I didn't see with Tibetan people. Tibetan people never come to teachings. They only come for initiations, Abhishek, you know, Abhishek. And then they leave. And Mongol here, mainly were women, there were a few men, and they had notebooks. And they were actually writing notes. And then, like in the classroom, there were something that oops, only in the Western students you see. You never see Tibetans saying, so can you explain further? But what was so interesting to me, they are asking very practical questions. So, he says, if my husband gets mad, uh, angry. Uh, so how should I do it? Should I do like what is uh, like uh, Shanti Deva said, be like a piece of wood <laughs> and not comment, you know, and not like that? Or should I respond to it? Uh, and it very practical question. People are really thinking, how can I implement in my life and make my living more skillful and Effect, how it will affect my family and, and how shall I act in my workplace. So more and more like this is happening. And now what I have found even that in some Buddhist center, now they're thinking about how to engage socially, how to help uh, you know, people in the community. Something that kind of Christians were very good because they, they have this system they have developed for, yeah. you know, long, long time. For many Mongolians, like this kind of notion of being socialized and being in, yes. inside the circle. Yeah, now Whereas if you follow Buddhism, there's this individualism that comes in. Yeah, but now, now you know, they, they want to work together. Some of them are doing work in hospitals. Uh, some are now engaging in prisons, teaching prisoners meditation, uh, to deal with negative emotions teach them how to meditate and calm themselves. And, uh, now uh, one center tries to develop hospice, mm -hmm. how to, to help the dying and poor, with Buddhist principles, with Buddhist teachings. So things are changing. Mm -hmm. Now if you were to Mongolia, you would have a big choice mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to go for teachings and, and practice meditation. And uh, things are really, really changing. So uh, when during the previous talk, Alan said that you know Bhutanese people have one of the highest GDH cross domestic happiness, you know, one of the happiest people, and I was thinking there has to be something fundamental about their upbringing, the people Bhutanese people were raised, um, and I was thinking okay maybe they maybe uh, when they were raised, they are raised as the very compassionate people, ethically uh, correct has kindness, right? And a lot of times, this kind of uh, qualities come from parents, how parents, from parents' upbringing. Uh, but my question is, can we actually move that needle 
further. In particular, can uh, in our formal structured education from first grade until the twelfth grade, can kindness, empathy, compassion become be part of an educational system, not the religious education system, mm -hmm. but more about teaching the quality, these kind of qualities. I, I agree. So even his holiness the Lamas uh, speaks often about it, and has even written a book about uh, secular uh, ethics, right? Sorry, two books now on secular ethics. That is to say, teaching these kind of principles without trying to, you know, in school, bringing this kind of uh, subject matters without in necessarily indoctrinating people in a certain religion because you make Buddhist religion because you may find in one classroom children being raised in different backgrounds and so that again not interfering with uh, upbringing at home in terms of religious beliefs but training them and teaching them how to relate to others. This is one of the big problems in America now from bullying. There are children who are committing suicide because they are bullied, uh, who are psychologically damaged, who are performing poorly at school because of, of bullying, uh, which can be very cruel and so on. And in some schools they have started doing this, but it's always like in private schools because they have more freedom than state schools, have started incorporating some of these elements and even teaching them some meditation, bring meditation in the classroom or certain kind of Tai Chi or something where they will, because young, especially children, they, they can't be still and <laughs> for a long time, you know. So you kind of bringing something physical through which they still have to calm themselves and they found that they, uh, not only that they are more harmonious among each other, but they are performing academically much better. So, um, yeah, that's something they definitely needed. Well, uh, Sue, our Sue Burton, right? You were behind the creation and publication of those books on two volumes on a history of Mongolian Buddhism and principles of Buddhism that were to be distributed to schools and be taught in uh, Mongolian schools. But I don't know what, for many years they were sitting in the boxes and I don't know if, if they have made their way into classrooms or not. But they were designed specifically for that. One volume was to learn a little bit about one's own history, kind of history of Buddhism in Mongolia, and the other was more kind of towards uh, learning some of these uh, principles that can make one a better person. Yes. Uh, no, history in the past in this Mongolia Buddhism uh, was heavily dependent on Tibetan Buddhism mm -hmm. and even the language yeah. of monastic language of this chanting was in Tibetan due to some maybe political reasons or other reasons. And maybe because of that, there were so many uh, well-known, accomplished Mongolian Buddhist scholars, mm -hmm. but in Mongolia, uh, most of them studied in Tibet. But uh, uh, there, was, there were not many really uh, academic monasteries in Mongolia. There were a few, but they can't give this highest degree. People have to go to yes. Tibet. Right. And uh, after communism, both in, in Mongolia and Mongolia, when Buddhism revived in Mongolia, uh, they have uh, some good uh, condition to send monks to India to yes. study and come back and develop Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But in, in Mongolia, they can't send monks to India, and there was not much interaction with Tibet, Tibetan Autonomous Region and Inner Mongolia. Because of that, the uh, situation is really difficult in yes. Inner Mongolia yeah. now. So uh, people tend to read now Chinese mm -hmm. and turn into Chinese Buddhism, because mm -hmm. that's uh, easy, because everybody reads Chinese, mm -hmm. and there are more popular uh, writings. And uh, so uh, one thing is, everybody wish to know, practice Buddhism. Yes. This is one thing. And in Mongolia there is this freedom, but I'm wondering if there is still some uh, hindrance or restriction because of this Tibetan uh, language. 
in Buddhist practice. Of course, there are some popular level people all talk in Mongolian, teach Mongolian, but if still uh, there is popular level and profound level because of Tibetan language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. But it's also, that is changing too. At the beginning, you know, uh, even on the radio, when there were you know, chants in the morning, it was always in Tibetan. Uh, you know, so good. people cannot uh, relate to you. But nowadays, I have found out, if you go, even the London has now uh, all these um, sets of uh, publications, which are all the prayers are now translated in Modern Mongolian. Uh, Tara prayers, if you go to certain centers, they would have, a, like we have it in, in the West now, right? In America, where you can have it in Tibetan and then in English beneath it. So they have now in many places in Mongolian centers, so either like this or simply uh, now in Mongolian, the whole set of uh, prayers. I went twice in the summer uh, when uh, Gandhi was organizing. Uh, meditation retreats for lay uh, people and they would, you know, in the afternoon would be time just sometimes of singing, everybody tired from meditation. And they were all in Mongolia, just, you know, beautifully uh, sung. So, and I know Humble um, Lama uh, of Erden uh, Zoo is now also translating, um, having everything translated, uh, uh, actually bringing some of the prayers from Inner Mongolia, like Mergingagans and others, and now uh, translating them into modern Mongolian and trying to introduce more for the especially lay people. And they're singing now, if, even if you go on YouTube, you can see them singing uh, sadhanas of Avalokchenrezi and so on, only in the Mongolian. <coughs> so yeah, it, it, this is, even this obstacle is slowly now removing because the more Buddhism is becoming this way accessible, more people uh, kind of join it. It becomes more meaningful than if you just read some words that, you know, you don't know what they mean. If I can just add a quick comment to that. Just a few weeks ago in Santa Barbara, we did, we hosted a Kemble. Just a couple of weeks ago in Santa Barbara, where Bess and I live, we hosted a Kemble, who is one of the principal abbots of a monastic community in eastern Tibet called Larungar, Larungar, and there are 40,000 monks and nuns there, and 10% of them are Han Chinese, mm -hmm. and the abbots speak fluent Chinese. They speak and read, mm -hmm. and can teach in Chinese. And one of the abbots has 2 million Han Chinese disciples mm -hmm. by way of the internet, because they have online courses, everything in Chinese. So one way that the Mongolians and Inner Mongolia might be able to re reconnect with their own Tibetan Mongolian Buddhist heritage would be to go back to the Tibetan lamas, and there are quite a few of them in Tibet who now have many Han Chinese disciples, and many of them speak very fluent Chinese. They're teaching in Chinese and even giving online courses in Chinese over the internet. Yeah. So that'd be another way they could connect. Yeah. And then I, you know, send young children to monastery as monk. Uh, they have to decide after graduated from this compulsory education. But at that time, they can't learn really classic Tibetan. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, as you know, uh, not like in the past, the, the children learn very mm -hmm. young. So uh, even in mon monasteries, they practice in Tibetan. Uh, not many people can do that. Yeah, and this is why in the beginning also, uh, especially younger people were not attracted to Buddhism. They would went to churches where mm. everything. Mormons would go to that uh, bridge school, and my goodness, like within the three months they are fluent in Mongolian, you know, and they, they could go from home to home and speak to people and you know, read them Bible and make it to them accessible and meaningful. And that has all changed. Now only 25 left in the country, or several hundred before. So she will completely know kind of imagination, vision for the um, future. Because the reason I'm asking is that um, I just today, for example, I had a client and 
sorry, <laughs> for some people that they self harmed. Mm -hmm. And then the psychologist, because I work in hospital, the psychologist says, oh, it's mm -hmm. nothing clinical. Mm -hmm. This child is not psych um, psychotic. So mm -hmm. if it's a social issue, it's your problem, you solve it. And what can we solve? This child has everything. Parents are really kind of caring for a child. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, they give up because it's a teenager and had all sorts of teenage problems. And parents give up because materially everything's there. Only child in the family all cares. But this child is bored and mm -hmm. self harm us kind of superficially. It became the second time now, and they say it's all your problem. Because every time those kind of problems come, I'm thinking, okay, this is well developed and materially everything is here in this society. If young people are leaving this, what about in Mongolia a few years' time? Because Mongolia is kind of, in a way, one way or the other way, leading to this towards this development we fall into. Mm -hmm. I'm always thinking, God, what? What is what it? Will what will happen in Mongolia? Do we have a structural system to support those children? Here, at least, they say, okay, you, you talk to social services and send them there. Yeah, <laughs> it's your yeah. problem. Yeah. So, what would you? Get, what would be your advice to those kind of young people who? Oh, I think I'm um, no. Um, I think you have to <laughs> choose. No, you are more uh, basically bored. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. Quite. Because it, nowadays I also see so many young Mongolians hooked on video games. Uh, all, all this internet cafe around this field with kids playing video games all day and uh, um, they're kind of following the trout that uh, now you see global problem with, with you and how to, was I once said, how to incite their imagination yeah. and uh, uh, when they're drawn to these other uh, things, right? So Alan, what would be your advice? <laughs> Well, I think they need to find teachers. And that is the teachers who are so traditional that they don't bring the, te the teachings into the 21st century. Yeah. They leave them right there in the 15th century. Yeah. As if we're still living there. And I love that time. I love very traditional time. But we're living in the 21st century. Exactly. And so there's some teachers who are so traditional that it's hard to see any relationship to the modern world. I lived for two years in Thailand. It's the same situation there. Many of the Buddhist monks there they're just reciting the old commentaries written 1,500 years ago. And it's very hard for modern doctors and lawyers and teachers and engineers to make any relationship between their lives and the issues they're facing every day with these old Pali suttas and commentaries. I didn't have faith in it as an extraordinary erudition, but it's also very contemporary. And so now so many of his books are in English, more, much more than in Tibetan. So I've been corresponding with a team of people now of Tibetans, who are translating his English books into Tibetan. So they're available for young Tibetans, because they're also struggling. In India, a lot of young Tibetans have very little understanding of Buddha Dharma. They say they're Buddhist, but it doesn't mean much, and because they can't relate to the very traditional teachings. But the Dalai Lama is simply spectacular in this regard, and he's met with world-class thinkers, philosophers, scientists, politicians, religious leaders from around the world. So I think if these young people, if they can, by any language, if they can have access to his teachings, uh, and there are others as well, of course, but he's really extraordinary, then he brings utterly authentic traditional Buddhist teachings fully into the 21st century. and makes them accessible, inviting, so they don't have to try to flip-flop between living in the 21st century and being Buddhist, but they can be richly in the 21st century by way of Buddhism rather than living in what, for many people, I think is like a barren wasteland. Because if all you have is materialism, you're living in the Sahara or out in the Gobi. But it's a big, big problem now. In most Buddhist uh, cultures, I, three years ago, I attended International Buddhist Conference in Delhi. And one of the issues that were raised by uh, representatives uh, of all kind of Indian Tibetan Buddhist uh, world, I think they're not interested. They all complain that young know, people are interested more in pop culture and they don't know what to do. Uh, this is one of the major problems now that they're all facing because also less and less young men are interested in becoming monks in Ladakh. Um, they have very few left and they're very worried about it. And one old Geshe got up and says, I'm telling our women make more babies. <laughs> they were like, what? Who is going to feed them? <laughs> you know? uh, because we need more monks, he was saying. 
it wouldn't solve a problem because they would too, you know, be more interested in uh, kind of what young people are interested today. And so, yeah, this is uh, not just Mongolian you know, kind of problem, but really in all these uh, Buddhist uh, countries, how to make now Buddhism again accessible, interested, in, meaningful to younger generations. And so that first year when we had this um, uh, 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 meditation retreat that Ganden organized, uh, actually we got some money from uh, one foundation in America for that. And uh, they advertised it to all universities in Mongolia for young people. It says, it's everything is free, you just come, you know, you need to, just like Christian missionaries were <laughs> attracting you, you just come and, uh, um, you know, come for this retreat. And some came because they were interested, some came because they said, I'll be bored all summer, so I may as well go. <laughs> And some uh, went there because parents said, you should go, 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 you know. And what, it was very interesting. Most of them didn't know anything about Buddhism, and there were a few who did more, but mostly not. And they came, what surprised me, most came from, Mongoli, uh, from the technical university, science and technology university, which I didn't expect. I thought they would come maybe from religious studies department. <laughs> and you know, at the beginning, uh, kind of it was strange atmosphere. You didn't know like how they will react. Uh, they didn't know each other either, so they were shy from each other. But they start well. So they had um, one monk from Belden was teaching the meditation, another was giving some teaching, and they have some volleyball games and, and so on. Friendships were developed. But at the end, one monk, uh, monk said to me, "You know, now they're better meditators than I am because they." At the beginning, you could hear them shouting, ah, you know, kind of, when is this going to be over? And then, as it went on into the second week, you, know, you couldn't, only fly outside, you could hear nothing, you know. I said, wow, they're better than I. I said, well, I said, I was moving all the time, <laughs> making noises, and they were so calm. And they started experiencing something. For the first time, they are facing their own minds. There was nothing else there to do, but you know, do only this. And the question that they started raising, you know, because at evening we are always question and answer period. These were really good questions, and they are coming right from meditation experience. And they said, "Can we come next year? Can we have them next year?" You know, so. Uh, giving them an opportunity to experience something too, not just, you yeah, know, it's good to hear teaching, of course, but for them, have the first uh, person experience and to uh, see some benefit right away. You know, the, uh, somebody was very sad and then had some issues and started openly speaking, which is not common for Mongolian people, are very private, I have learned, and they don't easily share. But here yeah, they started sharing, you know, things that were coming out of meditation, things that <coughs> were buried, um, <coughs> painful experiences from home or elsewhere. They started, because they started thinking, dealing with that in a more kind of rational, almost way, or, uh, so it was very interesting. So maybe, you know, uh, things like that slowly. But I see more and more younger people, you know, college people uh, attending. Not so many high school kids, but... <laughs> and I don't know in Mongolia, but here, what holds their retail. Yeah, this is really well. In this society. Yeah. Something is there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.